Great. Okay, so we'll get um, go ahead and get started with um, some introductions. And so I'm actually not alone in the room. We also have a Miss Meredith Fenton here. Um, and so for folks who aren't familiar, um, we're with Fenton. We're a social change agency. We work with um, a ton of different nonprofits and, and foundations on their communications needs. And so we're really excited to be having this partnership uh, with Pico California, um, part of which is this series of communications trainings. And so um, we had our first one last week on sort of like a communication strategy 101. And this is the second in that series um, about media relations specifically. Um, and yeah, so we can just kind of get started with introductions. My name is Mercy Albaran. Um, I'm a senior account executive at Fenton. Um, been doing communications for nonprofits uh, my whole career. Um, and uh, I work on our social justice practice. So um, organizations working on criminal justice reform, LGBTQ rights, immigration, education, all that stuff is up my alley. So I'm very excited to um, be able to work with you all. Okay. Hey y'all, my name is Meredith. Um, my last name is Fenton, but it's actually just a coincidence. And I'm a vice president at the Fenton San Francisco office. Um, and my role is to, I work with Mercy a lot doing similar work on a range of social justice issues. And also I love training. And what brings me to the work is I spent um, almost two decades in-house at nonprofits. And I actually started more as like a youth organizer and making like a community organizer. But over time started learning more how communications, media, um, messaging, storytelling were all these essential roles and started moving more and more into the communication side of things. And so um, I love getting to work with folks who are doing the work on the ground um, to help folks uh, figure out how to do more with less. I know that we, we can't make more time in the day, but we can be more strategic in terms of how we use that time to try to use things like the media to accomplish your missions and, and, and make the change you're trying to see in the world. So so happy to be here today and um, look forward to, to talking about um, how media can be a tool for each of your federations and projects within PICO. Great. And so let's um, just go around um, and also go through a quick introduction. If you can just let us know your name, um, your role, and what brings you to this work. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Uh, my name's Angie Noel. I'm from OCO in Oakland. Uh, I'm called communication specialist. Pretty new to the job. Uh, I, I got involved in... Um, media stuff a long time ago and have worked at kind of media outlets. Um, and I got involved in OCO through the local organizing committee in my own church. So uh, I'm very happy to be communication with OCO. It's not just the strands of my strands of my passion all passion all together in one place. Who else is on the line? Um, this is Carol at PACT in San Jose. And I am a communications person here, as well as some other various roles, <laughs> it feels like. And really, uh, I've been here for two years, and still feeling like the media stuff is really um, is tough. And I'm really eager to hear a little, you know, just to keep working on that. And so really, um, yeah, interested in how, making that more powerful for us. Great. Great. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Cool. And then do we have a couple more folks who've called in? I've seen a couple number, the number go up and down, so I wasn't sure if. Yeah, is there anybody else on the line? Yeah, Trinika is from Pico, I think. You are. I think she's, um, course, but she's there. All right, oh, Trinika yeah. is here. Okay, so I think that's all. That's uh, these are the folks that we have so far on the line. Great, cool. Okay, so then in terms of um, what we're hoping to 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 do today, um, we're going to start just by thinking about 
how do you sort of make those calls about when you need media? And, and today we're focusing on traditional media. So we're going to be doing another training down the line around sort of digital tools like social media, but this is more traditional like radio, TV, um, newspapers, magazines, blogs, etc. How do you figure out when that can be a really useful strategy to incorporate into your work? And then we're going to talk a little bit about what are some of the ways that you think about getting the attention of the media and finding a hook into a story that they might write about you. Um, then we're going to talk about what are the different ways that you actually figure out who to pitch, right? So you've decided you want media, but you still need to read to determine like which outlets and which specific reporters are going to be the ones who might write the story that you want to get. So how do you approach that and how do you reach out to them? Um, and what are those different tools that you need for different types of outreach to the media? Um, not everything needs a press release. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then we're going to give you some ideas about how you can cultivate sort of ongoing relationships with journalists and outlets that can lead to more coverage for your work. And then at the very end, we'll touch on, you know, sometimes it's really hard to get the media to, to cover our stories and tell our stories. And so there are ways that we can be doing that ourselves. And then we'll leave a little time at the end for just discussion and questions that any of you all might have. Um, so, you know, to start, you know, like, like I said, media is really time consuming and just hearing from both of you talking about media being a part and wanting to learn more about when to use it because it can be hard. Um, so often we find that folks sort of just assume like every event needs media, every campaign or every voter engagement thing needs media. And we're here to tell you that actually that's not always the case. And so the first step is always to really ask some questions about should media be part of what we're doing given that we have limited time and resources. And the first thing that we always ask ourselves is, well, what are your goals, right? Like what are the specific things that you're trying to accomplish? And will media help you get those? So for example, a lot of times when we ask folks, okay, well, what are you trying to accomplish? Like why, you know, they come to us asking for their help getting them in the media and we say, okay, great. Well, what are your goals? And they say, media coverage. <laughs> media coverage in and of itself should not be your goal. Media coverage should only be a tool that you use in order to achieve other goals. So for example, maybe you're doing advocacy work and we know that for many, both state and local governing bodies and elected officials, they're reading the local news and they're reading certain outlets to help inform the take that they're going to have on an issue. And so in those cases, getting coverage in the media that tells the stories in your way or, or builds a case of support for the bill that you're championing or really, you know, says why folks shouldn't vote for a particular um, bill or proposition, right, can really help move that advocacy on the issue. Um, and so you always want to get as, as concrete and as specific as possible in terms of what you're trying to achieve. And then it's really important to start thinking about, well, if that's our goal, will media help us achieve our goal or will it hurt us achieve our goal? And so here's two examples. Um, and, and one of them comes from work that, Trini, that Trinika was telling us about with Kiko, or about a, about a year ago when there was a huge caravan raising awareness about one of the bills related to immigration. Um, media started publishing this list of like who was good with Kiko on immigration issues and who was bad on, on those issues, right? And so the fact that it got in the media got these elected officials to be like, oh, I want to get on the right side of the list. And it was hard to get their attention until they started being in the media and feeling like they were being held accountable for their stances on immigration, right? So in that case, media would really help. But there might be other situations where it might actually slow you down. So for example, several years ago, we were working with some advocates um, in, both in California as they were trying to move this state to, take, to make it so insurance companies can no longer um, basically say that if you were a transgender person, they didn't have to cover your health care needs because there was an exemption for transgender health care within that insurance could do. And so we were trying to change the law in California and get rid of those exceptions. And we started to realize that if this story got into the media, we could face a huge backlash. We were actually making the progress we needed through one-on-one -on -one meetings and advocacy and organizing in Sacramento 
that made it so that folks were poised to, to, to force insurance companies to get rid of exemptions, but that if it became this big, huge public story, there was going to be political backlash, there was going to be things that would get in our way, and so it could actually hurt our right? And so those are just two examples, both related to advocacy, um, but for any other goal you might have, right? You can ask yourself, is media going to help us or hurt us? Um, some of the communities that you all work with may not trust particular media outlets for very good reasons. And so they may not be an effective tool if your goal is really building with folks on the ground who've been impacted by an issue. Um, whereas there's other cases where media, you know, particularly maybe radio or community newspapers or other outlets that your community really does trust, coverage there can really move things forward. So you always want to kind of make sure that media is the right tool to accomplish your goals. And then you basically have to ask yourself, well, if this is my goal, who are the people without whom I can't succeed? And you want to get really specific in thinking about that audience. And so, again, as you can see here with some of the examples, the things that we say no to are when they're just so generic or open-ended that it's, you're never going to be able to reach them all at once, right? There is no such thing as the general public, because if there was, we'd all be able to get a lot more done, because generally people would agree on things, but they don't. Same thing with voters, right? And you all know this really well in terms of the voter engagement efforts that I know you're also catching your breath from, but voters need to hear different messages and they need to see them in different places depending on who they are and what you want them to do. So we really recommend that you get really hyper-specific on what kind of profile of the audience that you're trying to achieve. So for example, um, you know, maybe it's, you know, you're really trying to move an educational policy. And so the people you really need to be, are going to get are the school board folks, right? And so then you can start to ask yourself, what kind of media would the school board read? Or what kind of strategies would make the school board members take notice? In which case, then maybe taking something out in the Oakland newspaper that gets everyday residents of Oakland calling the school board could help, right? But without sort of thinking through this strategy, that's when we end up spinning our wheels, both by going after media that's not strategic, but also getting coverage that ultimately doesn't help us lead to our goals. And then a few other considerations before you just sort of launch into going after media. The biggest one is, do you, in the exact moment of time that you would be reaching out to media, have capacity for outreach and follow-up, and are there people who are available to speak with them? You know, one of the, this, is, this happens to us more than we care to admit, but you know, sometimes folks will say, great, we want you to get us media. And so we're pitching and we're setting up interviews and then we go back to the folks we work with and we say, great, this radio station would like to interview someone today. And then we hear back from our partners, oh, well, nobody can talk to people today. Everyone's in a meeting on it, right? And so you always want to make sure that you're asking yourself that you're going to, if you get that media attention back, that you're able to respond to it because that can burn bridges with media. If they're really excited to do a story with you and then you're not able to follow through. So then once you've sort of had that strategic conversation, right, around will media really be effective given what, what you're trying to do and who you need to do it, then you can start to think about well, which media, what is the media the right strategy? And a news hook, right, is sort of like the little piece of bait that you offer to the media to get them to write a story. And while we know that the work that you all are doing is incredible, it should probably be talked about in every outlet every day, unfortunately that's just not how news outlets work. They're looking for news that they think their audience is gonna wanna read, that the, that audience is gonna click and share and buy newspapers to read, and so they're always thinking about the hook. And so we really quickly just wanted to talk through what are some of the most frequent hooks that you might use um, and sort of package what you're offering to the media um, within in order to get them to take notice. And so the first is that the release of data or research or reports 
often can be newsworthy. Um, and the example here was from a report that we worked on with um, Forward Together and the Ella Baker Center in 2015, where they had done a ton of research all over the country about the impact of incarceration on the family members of those who were locked up. And putting that report and being able to share new data gave um, all of the media that covered this, this data and the story uh, a hook for why they were telling the story at that time. Sometimes you don't even have to do the data and the research yourself. You might be able to take data that somebody else releases and then be able to apply it to the, to the work that you're doing. So, for example, maybe some new national study comes out around, you know, health outcomes in California. You can use that to tie into some of the health-focused campaigns that your federation is doing. Same thing, education data, immigration data, right? If you don't have to have created to try to use it as a reason why um, an outline would the story. Um, often, um, what you can do is take something that the national media is talking about and offer that localized hook, right? So, um, you know, and, and right now, it's like my mind is spinning with all of the national stories that are going around and how you can apply them to your to local hooks, right, given our national news cycle. But, you know, something big happens nationally. A lot of times, your local newspaper or local radio station is going to want to look at it through the lens of, okay, we're having this non-national conversation, but what does it mean in Merced? Or, okay, that's cool, they're telling lots of stories from folks in Los Angeles, but like, what's the northern California angle, or those types of things. Um, and then you can do the vice versa. So perhaps there is something that's emerging in one town, like for example, this happened a lot um, earlier in the year when there was a conversation about the water in Flint, Michigan. And then you start to see lots of media pop up about water rights and health and safety in communities of color related to water all over the country as more of a national story. So that's another way to find those hubs. Um, the next one is there are certain things that happen every year that the media is always looking for an angle to cover it. So they Things like Mother's Day. Right now we're in that time of year between Thanksgiving and um, the year-end holidays where lots of folks are looking for their feel-good stories, year-end stories, year-end giving stories, what are families struggling with during the holidays types of stories. Okay? Um, things like Independence Day or, um, again, you know, like Mother's Day, Arbor Day if you do work on the environment. You know, those can be hooks that you can sort of say, hey, we know you're probably already thinking about how to do your coverage on this holiday. Let us offer you this new angle. That could be really cool. Um, human interest stories, right, especially for longer form media and certain outlets, they really just want real stories of real people. And luckily, in, in Pico, you have no... No, um, no shortage of amazing faith leaders who have incredible stories, the people you're building with that you have some amazing stories, folks who've been impacted by things like Prop 47 who have amazing stories. And so one of the things that we've already been doing in partnership with Trinica and Pico California is, you know, pitching the media of like, hey, you're covering, you know, Prop 47 from this policy angle, but you haven't really told a human interest story about someone in your community in Riverside or Arcata or Sacramento or wherever you're based, right? And so helping them do that and tell those human interest stories. Um, and then the, the, the last one is, you know, often if you have somebody high profile involved, the media pays more notes, right? And that's not always possible, but, um, you know, here this was um, work where Prince, um, may he ever rest in power, um, was involved in the Yes We Code efforts, and that really helped get some media attention. But if you think about who, even if it's a local celebrity, right, like a really well-known leader of a church or, or faith community in your town, you know, those people who have a little bit of celebrity can sometimes create a, a new book where there might not have been one before. Great. Cool. Um, so, and I just want to pause before we go into the next section about actual pitching. Are there any questions or anything that's coming up for folks as we talked about sort of, you know, making 
Make sure that you think about your goals and if media align with them. Audience, news hooks. Does anything come up for folks before we move on? No? Okay, great. All right. Um, and so, um, ideally, you've already determined with your organization that yes, media will help us get to our goal. We know the audience that we want to reach. So the next step is, okay, so now we need to actually pitch, or and actually before that, you also decided that you do indeed have news and you've used one of these amazing news hooks um, to think about what you're gonna pitch in the media. So the next step is actually doing that pitching, right? And um, as we all know, there's a wealth of different types of media outlets you can pitch stories to. Um, so here's just a few that we wanted to name. And you know, depending on your campaign or event or situation, um, that could be better for one type of outlet versus another, right? Um, and so for example, if you know your organization is having a really large rally or something really visual, right, with a lot of people, um, that might actually be a really good story for TV. Um, you know, since ideally they like to have um, something visual going along with the story, right? Um, if it's, well, then if you could go on mute, if you're not talking, it's the background noise. We'll just let it die down. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, and so, yeah, really big events, lots of people, probably best for TV. Um, if there, if it's not so much like a really big event or rally, but say you have a really powerful story um, from um, a leader from a federation or you know a faith leader, anything like that, um, radio could actually be a really good outlet too. Giving someone that um, space to actually speak and tell their story, um, having that is also a really great option. Obviously, um, local and regional papers are also great. Um, Especially if you have um, a person, you know, for example, um, like the Merced Sun Star, they have someone who always covers like criminal justice issues, right? And so if you have something going on locally in Merced, probably best to reach out to that outlet versus like Sacramento or the New York Times or anything, right? Um, another uh, type of outlet that a lot of people forget are um, more trade or special interest, you know, so it may not be the mainstream, like, Sacramento Bee, East Bay Times, or anything like that, um, but there's also publications out there that only focus on education or only focus on criminal justice, right? Um, philanthropy, etc. Also, um, with working with all like all types of um, folks in the community that might have different languages or anything like that, ethnic media is also um, a great option, um, especially. Um, you know, in California, obviously, the Spanish-speaking media is really great, especially if you have leaders um, that can speak to their experience um, from that community. That's always an option. Um, and then for magazines and blogs, uh, magazines are, are definitely a little bit more tricky because they usually uh, plan out their stories months in advance. So this would also be an opportunity to pitch something that, again, is a little bit more evergreen. It could be a person's um, story that is particularly compelling. Um, but so it would have to be something that isn't necessarily tied to, um, you know, something immediate happening because magazines, again, sometimes you need to give them four, five, six months in advance. Um, and for blogs, I mean, blogs are also really great, and we'll talk about them a little bit more in creating your own media. But especially if you're trying to um, get folks to take a specific action, um, like sign a petition to lawmakers or anything like that, um, posting something to blogs, things that you can push out to um, your federations and to your followers um, is also the best, right? Because if you're pitching something and, it, it, and it's printed on the East Bay Times, it's kind of hard to then navigate a link on a newspaper to the actual um, you know, thing that you want them to sign, right? So blogs are also a great alternative. And in addition to these that are kind of about the types of stories for each media, just a reminder that different communities of people read and access different kinds of media. Mm -hmm. So in addition to thinking about what um, kind of outlet is the right fit for your story from a story perspective, also then imagine who would see this, like who listens to this radio program. Who watches the nightly news? And there's a lot of data available for free on the internet 
from Pew, PEW, and other research folks that tell you the usage trends. So for example, the nightly news is watched by older folks across ge geographies and demographics. If you're trying to reach folks under the age of 50, the nightly news just isn't going to be where you're going to reach them, right? And so you want to be thinking strategically about those kinds of ends as well um, in terms of who you hope might actually see or read or hear the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another example, you know, if you're really targeting, um, you know, California policymakers, you know, you might want to pitch a story directly to Capital Weekly, you know, which is something that um, policymakers and all their aides read every day, right? And so if it's something that's specific, that should definitely be a target, too. Cool. And so um, once you've decided uh, what type of outlet that you want to pitch and you select that outlet, um, it's time to target the actual reporter that you want to reach out to, right? Um, and so uh, <laughs> I think I tried to translate with this image here that this kind of requires a little bit of sleuthing, right? Um, and thankfully for the internet and Google search, um, it can be pretty easy. Um, so when you find that particular outlet, you probably want to search regular, I mean, for some specific keywords, things that could help you find that right reporter. Um, again, you wouldn't want to be pitching a criminal justice story to someone who writes on only the environment, right? Um, so search for what are the most recent types of stories that are related um, to your issue? Like, what are the most recent stories that have been published in that outlet recently? Again, just do searches online. Um, see if there's even actually someone who covers that specific beat. So some outlets actually do have a crime, courts, criminal justice reporter, which is awesome. If not, again, just searching in the outlet and seeing who's been writing about this recently can, it might help you find the right person. Um, and another thing you can do outside of just searching within that, um, that news media's website is actually Twitter. Um, so most reporters are actually on Twitter. Um, so a great way you can not only um, uh, find what a uh, reporter might be tweeting about, but what they might be interested in is just searching for their Twitter profile, right? Um, and it's, I think what's really great about it is that never before have we had a way to actually access what reporters are like thinking about or what's on top of, what's on the top of their mind like right away, right? So Twitter is also a really great place. And sometimes it's a really good place to find their contact info if you don't find it on, on the news website. Um, and uh, yeah, again, it's really about narrowing down like who's going to be the right person um, because there could be dozens of reporters at that outlet, right? But you want to find the specific person that would be really interested in your story. And to that end, too, um, something that comes up a lot is like, well, how do I know that a reporter is going to have the like cultural competency to cover my story or issue expertise that we can trust given that you all organize on difficult issues, right? And the best guarantee that a reporter is going to write a good story is that you like and feel really positive about their past coverage, right? So it's not just finding the beat, but even in one outlet, you might find, oh, there were five different reporters who talked about various issues related to criminal justice. Then in that case, I'd say, well, which one did you like the best? Who had the frame? Who, who used the language you felt most comfortable with? And then that's a really good way to start finding those reporters you want to build relationships with because they're probably of similar minds and backgrounds to understand the issues that you work on. Mm -hmm. Right. And so once you find that reporter or set of reporters, it's best to keep yourself organized, right? Um, so if you haven't already, you know, we always recommend that folks create some type of media list. Um, you know, ideally, uh, we like to use Google Spreadsheet just because, you know, you can, up, you can have multiple people updated at once. Um, but yeah, and it's really a great way to kind of just keep track of not only the reporter, um, but notes on if you pitched them before. If so, like, did you hear back? Did you not? Um, putting in their contact info, any recent coverage. Um, and I think the great thing um, about Google Spreadsheets, too, is that you can keep updating it, right? And that's really important because in this changing lands like media landscape, you know, people change beats, you know, change outlets all the time. So it's really important that um, you have that fresh media list and you keep updating it as you go. Um, yeah, so build that media list, keep it organized. And so once you have those targets, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how you reach them. 
So I generally have a rule of three. Um, I like to email the reporter first. Um, over 90% of reporters prefer that you email them first, not phone call, um, just because it's easier for them to sort of sift through and absorb the information. Um, so I, number one, I give them an email. Um, I either give them at least a day or a couple days, and if I don't hear from them, I'll email them again. Um, and then if I don't hear back, I'll usually give them a call if that's available. Um, and if, if you have their um, Twitter information, you can also tweet at them. Um, it doesn't have to be a direct message. You can literally just tweet at them and see if you know, they have, might have an interest in that story. Um, great. And so once you um, have that person that you want to target, you want to actually create that first pitch, which most likely will be in an email, right? And so going into drafting that email, make sure that you know at least these four things, right? Number one, know the news that's surrounding that issue, right? Um, is there, have there been any um, really big stories going on? You know, say you're pitching, um, we did this just a few months ago, pitching a new report that talked about um, reset in their police department and um, the different practices that they were doing that was actually harming um, inmates um, and formerly incarcerated folks. Um, and so you want to know like what's going on about that story recently. You also want to know that target, that um, reporter that you're pitching to, what have they written about recently? Um, I know this has happened to me before, but um, it's the worst feeling when you've created this pitch and you, you send this story idea to the person only to find out that they just wrote a similar story like the day before or like the week before and it's just like ah <laughs> like because they're not going to write it again you know so make sure before you reach out that you're familiar with um what the reporter's been writing about and then also know make sure um you have a good idea of what your main messages are going to be like what is the number one or number or two things that you want to um get across in your pitch right um, whether it's, you know, the story of an individual person or trying to, you know, for example, um, pressure folks to support Prop 47 or any other local legislation that you're trying to push. Make sure that that is you, you know how to talk about that very clearly and that that is a main part of your pitch, right? Um, and then another thing to think about is what are some um, potential questions that you think that folks might have about that particular issue. And just be prepared to answer them in case you send that pitch and then the reporter has some questions like, well, there's some controversy. I hear the sheriff saying X, Y, Z. Um, just be prepared with those answers so you can respond promptly. Um, and then again, for the actual email, um, be as brief as you can. You know, reporters are getting hundreds and hundreds of emails a day. Um, there's no need to put every single bit of information in that email, um, but you want to make sure it's just, you know, maybe just a few very short paragraphs, right? Um, make sure to personalize it. You know, reporters can tell if you're just copy and pasting the same email to um, different reporters. You want to make sure that it's clear to them that this is a story they should be writing about. Um, and you can do that by either referencing some past coverage they've done or um, things that might be going on right now in the news that would be relevant to them and the types of stories that they write. So make that really clear in the beginning so they know that you're writing to them um, because you think that they're the right person to write about this, not just to anyone. Um, and then again, um, make sure that you put your most important information first. Um, whether it's uh, a call to action or, you know, this bill needs to have, you know, X done about it. Um, and then make sure you end with a clear um, ask and let them know what you might be able to offer them, right? Make sure you're not just telling them about the story, but letting them know that you can actually connect them to spokespeople or different experts on this issue. Um, so that's why they should definitely get back to you because you can offer that valuable information. Um, and so I'm just going to show you a couple of sample pitch emails. Um, so this one, um, in a nutshell, was actually we were working with um, a foster youth organization, and they had this really big campaign going on um, around the Super Bowl. Um, and they actually had um, several um, either current or um, ex-football players a part, a part of their campaign um, just pushing on uh, why it's important that um, – uh, foster youth get the supports that they need, right? And so um, this reporter, we did a lot of research and we found that Forbes actually had a sports writer that was really interested in community impact. So that was like, ding, community impact, 
ding, sports people. Um, and so this was the right person, right? And so um, just notice, I, I like to use um, a lot of bold um, for the most important information. Um, even in my headline, I make it very clear um, in just a few words, like what this pitch is about. Um, you know, obviously they're a sports writer, so they care if any famous athletes are involved. And that community impact, focusing again on the foster youth that are being impacted by this campaign, right? Um, and so I not only bold that, most, that very important information, but I also hyperlink to um, videos or um, other data that could be of interest to that reporter. Um, and yeah, I try to put the most important information at the top first. And then this is just another example. Um, this one was focused on an actual study um, on that we were working with a foundation. So they had done this 20 year study um, that talked about how um, social skills um, actually really affect um, children's outcomes as they become adults. Um, and so here, you know, again, we didn't have to go into every single detail of this study or research or what have you. We just go into what is the most compelling message um, so you'll see that we um, we bolded it there, um, that social skills really are a big predictor. Um, and uh, we also, I also bolded that, you know, when is this study actually going to come out, anything like that. And then you'll see at the end, again, we sort of share, like, we can offer you spokespeople, um, you know, experts that can talk to you more about this. Um, yeah, and again, you'll see it's it's conversational. We talk about how this person would be really interested in this type of story, right? So making sure it's tailored to them. And so there are a few other tools that I'm sure folks use when you're reaching out to the media. Um, press releases, media advisories, sometimes if you have visuals like photos, B-roll, anything like that. Um, and so just some um, quick uh, things to think about when you're considering these tools, right? Um, so for a press release, I mean, ideally, you know, not everything deserves a press release, right? Um, it can be very time consuming. And so but how I like to describe what a press release is to folks is basically if um, you have a, a big story going on, if there's like a, if you're releasing some new data or anything like that, if someone gave you the key to whatever, the San Francisco Chronicle or the East Bay Times, right, and asked you to write the story, um, that's what a press release is, right? So it follows more of a narrative. It's the story as you would want it written, right? You always get quotes from folks, everything like that. Um, and so that's more of a press release, right? Um, versus say you're having an event. Um, you know, I know Faith in the Valley just had their big convening to kind of announce their new partnership with all kinds of um, faith groups in, in um, the Central Valley, right? And they were having like over a thousand folks there. Um, you know, we decided that it was definitely like an opportunity for TV. Um, since there would be a lot of folks there, they would, there would be many opportunities for visuals and everything like that. Um, we decided that actually a, a good approach to um, publicize that event was actually more of a media advisory. So that's just super bare bones, like who, what, when, where, why. It doesn't have any quotes or anything like that, but is more just for, um, you know, uh, TV folks and reporters and cameramen to, or camera folks to know, like, where do we need to go? Who Who's going to be there that's important? And, you know, where and what time, right? So very bare bones. Um, yeah, and so I would say, you know, it always depends on the situation if you want to do a press release or not. Um, but we find that more times often than not, um, folks that we, we train, you know, put press releases out for anything, you know? So if it's like, we hired a new person or, um, you know, we're hosting a local event that we do every year, we do quarterly, right? Maybe not the best use of a press release, right? A press release should be focused on like, again, like if there's a really big news hook that you have, right? Uh, and even then, sometimes a simple email pitch is all you need. So we had a really big hook in that example that Mercy shared where the football players were coming together mm -hmm. to raise awareness about foster youth. There was no press release for that in campaign. 
We never even needed a press release. All we needed were those emails, and once they got interested, then we could set them up to have interviews with different people, right? So we saved a lot of time on the, on the part of our, our, our partners by just giving them permission not to even need that press release. And, um, you know, we, we can be a tool, a resource in helping you figure out whether you need one or not, as well as other folks who do communications within Pico, I'm sure, can help figure out when are those times which are uh, rare, but um, where a press release is really needed. Mm -hmm. um, and I know sometimes where a press release can be handy is if you're reaching out to really small um, niche outlets because sometimes they just reprint it. Um, yeah, so that happens sometimes, but not all the time. So again, it's kind of case by case basis. Um, and just really quickly, some uh, common mistakes um, that we want to make sure that you avoid. Uh, like we said with our pitches, they're very customized. Um, so we always tell people if you've got that list of reporters that you just blast, um, you know, a general email to all the time, don't do that. <laughs> you know, again, reporters get hundreds of emails a day. They can, unless you are like, you know, have a really a close relationship with them, nine times out of ten, like if they can tell that um, your email is just a BCC, they'll mark you as spam, you know, and even actual sometimes um, folks' emails have, I don't know, some funky thing where if you do BCC folks, the actually, I don't know if it's Gmail or other, other places, but they actually flag it and put it in people's junk folders. So you want to avoid that. Again, make sure that that pitch is really targeted, right? I know we just talked about the second point a little bit, right? Um, issuing unnecessary press releases. Um, I think this is also really true for um, press conferences. Um, you know, again, press conferences are very labor intensive, you know, getting folks together, doing all the coordination and everything like that. Um, and so again, case by case basis, but most of the time, unless there, unless there's some really big story going on, or you have some really important folks coming together or, um, and talking about some, like your particular issue, chances are you probably don't need um, a press conference. Um, and then again, uh, with sort of the pitching, I know this has happened to me before, especially if I'm um, sending a pitch and customizing it to a few reporters, just make sure you double check um, and proof your emails, because um, copy and paste errors happen a lot. I know that I've sent out emails before where um, I've made some adjustments, but then I forgot to actually change the, the person's name or the actual outlet that I named. Um, so that always sticks. So just make sure that you um, double check those emails. Um, and then the other two, we, the next one we kind of already talked about, um, making sure you do your research so you don't send a story to someone that's already written about it. Um, and if you are pitching uh, multiple people to, at, a, at an outlet, you know, ideally you have the one person that you're targeting, but say you have someone as a backup, um, just make sure that you're transparent with the reporter, right? Like say that you, you pitch reporter A and then you're sending something to reporter B and then just say in your email like, hey, just so you know, I already sent this information to so-and-so. You know, because there's nothing worse than, you know, two reporters coming to their editor with the same story and then the editor being like, what? So just be transparent. Um, and just a few quick tips on um, following up and um, starting off that sort of relationship building with reporters. Uh, you know, again, you know, once you have that interest, say, you know, you sent out an email and someone's really interested, um, make sure that you respect their deadlines 100%. Um, you know, if uh, a reporter needs to get in something by three, um, make sure that you have that spokesperson ready. Or if you know that you're not going to be able to provide that information, let them know up front and, and, you know, think of are there any um, local partners or another federation or someone else that you could offer instead. Um, so just, you know, making sure that um, you can be seen as a trusted resource for that reporter because if you do pitch and then they can't come through, like, then that can be really tough because the reporter might not know, well, if they come with me to something next time, how do I know they're going to get me something, right? Um, and then a couple basic things. If a reporter does end up writing a story um, about your organization or campaign, you know, say thank you. I mean, it sounds super basic, but um, I know from a lot of reporter friends, they've told me, you know, I get a lot of hate mail or like your article sucked because of X or something like that. Um, so, and so even just saying like a simple thank you is always great. Um, and make sure that you um, share and promote that story. You know, 
put it on your Facebook, put it on Twitter, send it in a newsletter to your partners, let them know that um, this great article happened um, and share it because, um, you know, likes, um, link clicks, retweets are really currency for reporters. Um, and it also helps um, um, editors notice different stories. You know, if there's a particular story that's getting a lot of traffic that day, that's a sign to them like, hey, we should keep following this story, right? Um, so it's really important to share that stuff. Um, and again, just a little bit more on um, cultivating those relationships with reporters. You know, again, I, I just always like to remind folks that reporters are people too, right? Um, and so always kind of put yourself in their shoes. Um, again, um, know their beat and what they're interested in. You know, you don't always have to pitch something related to your organization to reach out to them. Sometimes you might find like some interesting data that you or a partner has put out or another story that's related to the work you do but isn't like, your organization and just send it to them being like, hey, you know, I was thinking of you. I just saw this great article or this like interesting data. I'm not sure if it would be helpful for you, right? Um, again, those like short little emails or exchanges it just really help build you up as a trusted resource, which is what you want to be for reporters, right? And for your local folks, a lot of times journalists love to grab coffee and just hear about what you're working on, and it's a great way to get to know what they're interested on. When I worked at the Ellen Baker Center, our media relations person would do that with folks from the Oakland Tribune or the SF Chronicle because we knew there would be things we'd be wanting coverage for in those outlets. So when you have time, you're going, and not for a list of 50 reporters, but maybe for those top three, right, who are already based in, in the place that you are based. It, 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 they often respond really favorably to those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And we already kind of talked about the saying thanks, giving those shout outs and using your social media. Um, and so now that we've gone through a ton of this stuff, we wanted to make sure it's kind of all summarized in a quick checklist that you can use if you have some sort of upcoming event or campaign going on. Again, these are the questions you want to ask yourself to make sure that you're media ready, you know, from your goals to your audience, to your news hook, to who you're actually going to pitch and what you're actually going to say and how you followed up. These are all things that you want to keep in mind. Um, and then just really quickly, I know we only have a few minutes left, but if traditional media isn't working out or isn't a quick, isn't a, a fit for what your, um, what your goals might be, don't forget that there's a, a variety of different ways you can get um, your stories out there, right? From if your organization has a blog to um, if you have any leaders that um, have Huffington Post accounts, you know, you can apply for a Huffington Post account if you want to, you know, apply to be a contributor or anything like that. Um, Medium is actually a, also a great emerging sort of blog platform that um, anyone can really post ideas to, right? And it's easily shareable online. Um, and so we'd actually recommend that. And then also there's ways that you can engage a traditional media that doesn't have to be pitching a story, right? They could uh, There could be, um, you know, a story put out about um, – Prop 47 or anything like that, that, you know, maybe they missed the mark or they're missing the, like, a part of the story, right? You can respond with a letter to the editor, you know, um, and we're happy to talk more about that. Um, but, you know, if you want to respond quickly and just make sure that you um, uh, kind of make sure that that uh, reporter uh, knows that there's another side of the story or anything like that, that's a good way to go. Um, also, drafting op-eds um, can also be good. Um, Again, if, if there's some sort of um, controversial uh, topic going on or if there's bills that need to be passed and people have serious opinions on it, um, uh, putting together an op-ed from a notable person from your organization could also be a good way to get that bridge. Um, yeah. And then one thing we just wanted to make um, folks know about is that through the, the same sort of grant support that Pico California has that's allowing us to do these trainings, we also can follow up with you after this training, right, to sort of dive into what are some of the specific questions you have have around things we talked about today. So, um, you know, we can help you, um, like, do a bit of a media audit. Um, that's something we, you know, we've done 
for uh, like the Federation in Sacramento of helping them sort of look at what is their local media landscape and where might there be some reporters that they should really focus on for, for building um, connections to. Um, we can look at different press materials that you have just to tell you um, how to strengthen them or, um, or how to fine tune them. Um, as you're planning for 2017 or even for, the, and we know you, some of you have some events and actions before the end of this year. If you just want someone to sort of be a thought partner and talk through, okay, will media help us achieve our goals? What media will help us achieve our goals? How should we really approach this and what could our hook be? We can jump on and do a, like a quick 30 minute coaching call to just talk through it with you all. And um, in this, this, this presentation, which we'll be sharing out, has both of our emails. And all you have to do is just drop us an email and we can get started from there. Yeah. So with that, we only have a couple minutes, but we did want to just see if folks have any quick questions or, or, or comments about either, um, you know, what you've tried that um, really helps um, with your media activities or questions you have about anything that we shared. Well, I realized I've made about 500 of the mistakes that you mentioned. <laughs> no worries. The first step is identifying the problem, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm right with you. So it feels like things are changing, mm. you know, like over, like over time, like you look up and you're like, oh, I should be doing this differently. So this is really helpful. Okay. I'm curious too um, about we have a local like pub, I don't know what it is it's a it's called Create TV it's in San Jose and it's um, kind of we did like a PSA there I feel like there's a lot of resources that they're like a I guess a public access station mm. and I wonder if that could be a good resource. It can be, um, especially public radio and public TV and public access type of things do sometimes have where anyone can go into their studio and record a short yeah. video that they'll play on the air or may have um, other resources to help you um, get your stories told. So that's a great thing to look at. And then just to the first point about your comment of like it feels like things are changing, I would just acknowledge it feels that way because it is. Like the field <laughs> has changed so drastically in the last 10 years. And even it, it was changing 10 years before that. Newsrooms are getting smaller. Few and fewer people and companies own the media, right? And so those are just realities that we have to deal with. It means that, you know, that's one of the reasons why press releases are less useful because it's not like at any given outlet, there's a bunch of people and they need to share the whole press release around to find who's going to write it. Um, there's just fewer folks. It's also why um, being more targeted to get to the right media rather than blasting media makes more sense. It is a changing sector. And so hopefully these can help you think about now that we have places like Twitter to connect with the media. And now that we do have, um, we're looking at the real, real limitations that reporters and actors face um, can help you, again, get that coverage you need when you need it the most. Or give yourselves permission to make those hard choices that, hey, if in this moment we're just not going to have any spokespeople available to talk to someone, hey, we can give ourselves permission from trying to line up interviews, right? And some of those kinds of considerations, hopefully, as well. Other questions? Yes. We might have room for one more. Well, it's not a question so much as uh, it'll be something I'm carrying from one of your trainings to another because I signed up for all of them. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the the uh, immigration story is really bubbling uh, in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, I could see it play out in a lot of different things that you mentioned today about a local story that's national or a national story that's local and who's going to cover it. And just it's, it's, uh, it feels like, we actually have an event today um, in Oakland uh, that um, lots of the electeds agreed to come to. Um, but it feels like we're sitting on top of a volcano to me. Yeah. Because that you may or may not be able to uh, direct how it um, explodes into the public interest and um, awareness 
but just everything. It just feels like a bubbling uh, volcano. So, and the, and there are a lot. There's a lot of interest um, in every sector, not certainly among the electives, but all along. So, um, I'd be interested in trying to f- figure out and and use your resources and and just experience to help us um, manage our resources uh, so that we can. Um, get out the messages we want to in the, in the best way we can. Yeah. We've been limited resources and fast pace change of the story. Yeah. You know, and, and one thing I would offer and have, you know, really look forward to ongoing conversation to that end of how do you build on some of those volcanoes, but, but you all have a one built in hook, no matter what the topic is, which is offering reporters the faith angle. Right. And we should have said that before more clearly, but often for a story like with immigration or the debate that's going to happen about sanctuary cities, like there's this big leadership from faith leaders around keeping sanctuary cities or turning, um, you know, sanctuaries into sanctuaries. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but but I can also see that playing out on almost any topic of like it's going to be looked at through this political lens, and what is sort of the faith leaders imperative or the or the people of faith imperative on an issue, or how do they look at it through the organizing that's happened connected to faith spaces? I think there's a built-in hook on many of the things that you organize around just simply because of who you organize with. Right. Agreed. Right. Cool. Well, we hope today has been useful. We're glad to hear that it's already making some thoughts bubble up. Um, and we just look forward to continuing the conversation. I know that we've probably raised in some cases more questions than answers, but we look forward to help some of the answers. So let us know how we can continue to work with your federations to apply some of what we've covered today. If there's anything you want us to go deeper in, and again, if we can actually help provide your capacity by doing any research or review of, of, of your media pieces, we'd love to do that. So look forward to much more to come. Yeah, this is Trinika. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining the call. And I just want to say that I noticed that um, all of the wonderful people on the call are staff. And um, I encourage you to, um, you know, uh, send this opportunity um, and recruit leaders and clergy um, to be a part of these trainings. Um, not all leaders. Um, uh, want to necessarily, uh, you know, make phone calls. Some of them actually want to do more, more media, want to do more communications. Our leaders are volunteers and they have a variety of different talents. And we should, as communications professionals or folks who are responsible for communications, be looking for leaders um, who are interested in assisting us with our communications as well. So please, please, please. Please encourage your leaders and your clergy to sign up for these uh, training uh, sessions as well. Can I ask, uh, kind of follow that up a little bit? I went to the uh, workshop that I was at prior to this one, um, said that the, it was being recorded and that um, the uh, PowerPoint and, and I guess the video was going to be shared. And I don't know if I missed that information coming back out. No, we haven't sent it out yet. I know that I, I would like to work with Trinika to figure out what's the, the best way to disseminate that information um, to all of the federations. So whether that's a, another email or something like that, either after all of the trainings or after each training, um, we, can, we can talk about that. But yes, all these um, trainings are going to be recorded. We will provide you with... Um, you know, a PDF version of the actual presentation too. So if there's any staff or leaders um, that weren't able to attend, um, you can definitely share this with them. You know, if you have any new leaders or staff coming on board, you could even make this as a part of their onboarding training, you know, to just spend, um, you know, an hour just to watch this presentation and take a look at um, the actual, you know, uh, PowerPoint or anything like that, right? Um, so yeah, we're going to make these available, um, and we'll we'll communicate as soon as we can once we figure out what's the best way to do that for all the federations. But yeah, I 100% second Trinika. Please, you know, invite um, folks to our next session. I know I think the next one is going to be in person um, in San Francisco on the first, which will be our spokesperson training, which will be super fun. Um, but uh, again, a really 
um, great opportunity to get not just staff, um, but actual leaders involved. Um, so please let them know. Especially yeah. those folks in the Bay Area, because you're right here. Right. So you don't have to put them on the plane or train or drive 200 miles. You're right here. So right. I'm really, really expecting and looking forward to a huge Bay Area contingent um, on uh, the 2nd in San Francisco. That's my challenge. All right. And I heard you. They had a rule, and that's an opportunity whether people have done a million media interviews or have never been on TV in their life. We'll prep people for what do you do when you find yourself in a situation where you have that opportunity. We're actually going to give folks a chance to go on camera and get used to what that feels like and sounds like and everything. So please uh, tell folks to, to come. We'd love to see you and all the folks you work with there. Uh, I'll certainly do, do my best uh, to get all the attendance you're looking for. <laughs> one other thing, though, because I was thinking about that one um, as one that there would be a lot of interest in afterward and just uh, so I don't know how you're going to handle them if you're going to put them all out at once or some before the others but if I was going to fast track one of them it might be that one uh-huh got it great because it's just broad interest whether you're the communication person or not yeah totally. cool. great. anyway I really enjoyed the session uh, all right uh, thanks everybody and again yeah, our emails are right here on the screen um, please contact us if, uh, with any follow-up on things that you might need, questions, you want us to take a look at a, a press release or a media list you got, what have you, just email us.